you already learned in lessons 1 through 12. In lesson 1, you understood an entire conversation before we taught you a single sign. Then we showed you 100 signs you'd understand even if we didn't teach them. In lesson 2, we showed you that you can communicate lots of information with just facial expressions and how very, very important your facial expressions are in sign language. In lesson 3, you learned that you must adjust your signs to the situation because drinking from a water fountain is different from a hose or a straw. In lesson 4, we showed you many signs for things that are just one piece of the visual picture they represent. In lesson 5, we showed you that lots of signs for actions look just like the real actions. In lesson 6, you learned to form the 26 letters of the manual alphabet. We also showed you 1 through 20 and 30, 40, 50, up to 100, and promised we would get to the rest of the numbers in a later lesson. So, since lesson 6, you've been able to fingerspell any word you didn't know a sign for. Yet. In lesson 7, we showed you again that many signs for things are just a part of the visual picture they represent. But this time, the part is also moving. In lesson 8, we showed you that lots of signs for characteristics, like blurry and dark, look just like the characteristics they represent. In Lesson 9, you learned signs for things that are based on what we do with them and to them. In Lesson 10, you learned that you can use your index finger to represent a person from head to toe, or a thing. We also showed you how to use the rest of your fingers to represent many people or many things. In Lesson 11, you learned that you can use the V to represent a person from the waist down your fist to represent a person's head, your two palms to represent two feet, and a hands that often show the relationship between two people or things. And in Lesson 12, you learn to use the V to represent eyes for sight-related signs, and how to use your fingers to represent words in talk-related signs. And, and that, that takes, takes us, us up, up to, to lesson, lesson 13. Which I guess is where we finally are and where you've been all along. In this special review lesson, you can practice understanding and signing sentences we've selected from all the previous lessons. If you can comfortably read and sign these sentences, then you're definitely ready to go on to the next lesson on numbers and the following two lessons that switch from sign language vocabulary to sign language grammar. But you'll still learn more vocabulary in these lessons, too. If you have trouble understanding the practice sentences in this lesson, you need to go back to the previous lessons and get some more instruction and practice. Which lessons? Well, we've made that pretty easy for you because each part of the following practice emphasizes a different lesson. That way you'll know exactly where to go to get some help if you need it. If you find that you need to go back to some of the previous lessons, you can still do the next three lessons, but make sure you're up to speed with Lesson 1 through 12 before you begin Lesson 17, because the number of new vocabulary words in 17 really increases. After you finish reviewing previous lessons, use the practice sentences from this lesson again to make sure you're ready for Lesson 17. Good luck!
12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30. Hey, what about 21 through 29? 40, what? And, and 31 through 39. 50. Oh, I figured no one was using those numbers anymore. 60. Remember back in lesson six when we taught them finger spelling? Yeah. 70. And we also taught them a few numbers, you know, enough to get by for a while. 1 to 20, then 30 and 40 and 50 up to 100. Yeah. 80. I remember. Well, since we didn't teach any of the other numbers, I just thought I'd get along without them, too. 90. You're right. We didn't show them how to sign most of the numbers yet, so we'd better do that right now. 100. Wait a minute. Let's not be so hasty. That could really cut into the progress I'm making in my exercise program. 31. 31. Thirty-two. Come on, come on. Oh, Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Now back to the twenties. This is twenty. Looks very much like the sign for a bird. Who knows why? We certainly don't. But yes, this is the sign for twenty. Now, twenty-one. This is 21. Looks just like a gun. Again, don't know why, it just is. Now, 22 makes good sense. 22. Now, things do start to get into a pattern with this L shape as the first part of the rest of the 20s. 20 and 3. 23. 20 and 4 is 24. 20 and 5 is 25. 26, 27, 28, and 29. Okay, one more time. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 20, Eight, twenty, nine. Now here's some practice. So, we're going to assume that you're able to sign everything we taught you in lesson six. Maybe you've even gone beyond that on your own or with someone else's help. We hope so. In this lesson, we'll fill in some of the blanks we left in Lesson 6 and give you more information on how to use numbers in sign language. The numbering system in sign language is pretty straightforward. Once you learn the base numbers like 30, 40, and 50, it's just a matter of signing the second part. A couple of the numbers in the 20s are the only exceptions, so let's do those last. We'll start with 30, and just add 1 for 31. Add 2 for 32. 3 for 33, and so forth. 34. 30. Five, thirty, six, thirty, seven, thirty, eight, thirty, nine, which brings us to forty. 
forty one, forty two, forty three, forty four, forty five, forty six, forty seven. Forty eight, forty nine, fifty, fifty one, fifty two, fifty three, fifty four, fifty. Five, fifty six, fifty seven, fifty eight, fifty nine, sixty, sixty one, sixty two. Sixty three, sixty four, sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine. Seventy, seventy one, seventy two, seventy three, seventy four, seventy five, seventy six, seventy seven. Seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty, eighty one, eighty two, eighty three, eighty four, eighty. Five, eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety, ninety one, ninety two. Ninety three, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine, one hundred. You already know that this is the sign for 100. Now, let's add to what you already know. What's 200? Right, 200. And 300? Right, 300. 400? 500. 600. 700, 800, 900. Now, you should be able to count up to 999 with the knowledge you have already. What's 729? 
It's 729. 352? 352. 835. 938. 625. 392. 998. 999. And here's 1,000. The sign for a thousand is based on the letter M, which is the Roman numeral for a thousand. It's been modified to include all the fingers of the hand. One thousand. Now you can express any number from one to a million. One thousand nine hundred is one thousand nine hundred. Eight thousand five hundred is eight thousand five hundred. 8,550 is 8,550. 8,558 is 8,558. And of course, you'd sign all the other numbers in the same way. 999,999 is 999,999, just like the number says. And then there's a million. The sign for a million is based on the letter M which is the Roman numeral for 1,000. It's been modified to include all the fingers of the hand. A thousand to the second power equals a million. One million. I think that should cover all the whole numbers you'll need. So let's get into some fractions. Since fractions are one number over another, that's exactly what you do. Sign 1 over 2 for 1 half. Sign 1 over 3 for 1 third. Sign 1 over 4 for 1 fourth. Or any two numbers that are in your fraction. Now, let's talk about ordinal words or words that tell us what order someone or something is in, like first, second, third, and so forth. This is the first person in line. Otherwise, sign first by twisting the number one toward you, such as for your first love. This is second, as in Dorothy was the second person in line. Otherwise, sign second by twisting the number toward you, such as for the second grade. This is third, as in, Sally was the third to cross the line. Otherwise, you sign third by twisting the number three toward you, such as for third street. This is fourth, as in Luke was the fourth person to cross the line. Otherwise, sign four by twisting the number four toward you, such as for the fourth floor. This is the fifth, as in, Jimmy was the fifth one to cross the line, yeah. Otherwise, you sign fifth by twisting the number five toward you, such as for the Fifth Amendment. You want to also use one and two to show how often something happened, once or twice. Form the number one and strike it across your palm to indicate an action happens once. Form the number two and strike the middle finger across your palm to indicate an action happens twice. This is also the sign for double. 
And before we send you on to do some practice, there's just one more number-related topic to cover. Dollars and cents. You touch the number one to your temple to show one cent or a penny. Why? Maybe because S-E-N-S-E, -S -E, cents, and C-E-N-T-S, cents, sound alike. And hearing people who influence signs used this sound relationship when the sign was created. Or maybe there's another reason. We'll probably never know. The sign for dollar is more logical. Let your open palm represent a dollar bill as you move your other hand across it to show its shape. Dollar. So, just point to your temple to indicate cents and show how many cents you mean. Two cents, five cents, ten cents. For dollars, show how many dollars you're talking about, followed by the sign for dollar. Ten dollars, thirty dollars, seventy-five dollars. Did you notice I didn't use any numbers from one to nine? Why? Because we sign one dollar through nine dollars like this. One dollar, three dollars, seven dollars, nine dollars. We've put everything you've learned about using numbers into the following practice. Let's see how you do.
It was inevitable that a lesson about numbers would eventually lead to arithmetic. So, here are some signs related to simple math concepts. We were a little creative again with our explanations, but they will help you to easily remember how to make these signs later. This sign is similar to the sign for EST. She has the most. This sign is related to the sign for add. There's something here and I'm adding more to it. This sign is related to the sign for more. There's something here and I'm adding more to it. This sign is a variation of the sign for more. When we have more, we have a number of things. I can take away some or all of the things in my hand. This is also the sign for eliminate. This sign is similar to the sign for egg. Tap the egg on the bowl and the shell divides into two parts. This is the sign for divide. Put together these two V's to form an X, a multiplication sign, and the sign for multiply. This is also the sign for calculate and for figure, as in Figure things out. Use the letters M for mathematics. Use the letters A for algebra. And use the letters G for geometry. Many fingers equals many people or things. Moving your hands up and out asks the question, how many? What's the difference between a cottage and a mansion? Size. What's the difference between a narrow road and a wide road? Size. What's the difference between a gift box and a crate? Size. You got it. And I think you do get this simple but important grammar concept in sign language. Size matters. When the size of an object is obvious or important, the size of your sign should show it. A salad plate, a dinner plate, a serving plate, a toy piano, a grand piano, a book, a tiny book, a huge atlas. Yes, size makes a difference. A huge difference.
you're used to making all your signs directly in front of your body, which was perfectly all right for the sentences you've signed so far, like, Judy writes a letter. The tornado destroyed the house. The boy picked up his basketball. But picture this. The boy picked up a box and a ball. I could sign it like this. The boy picked up a box and a ball. But then it looks like the ball and the box were occupying exactly the same space. Well, I know enough about physics to know that we've got a physical problem here. In sign language, we deal with multiple objects in a scene by placing them in their appropriate locations. In this situation, it makes sense to show the box and the ball side by side, but not on top of each other. The boy picked up the box and the ball. Now picture this other situation. My aunt and uncle come to see me. Let's say this is my aunt and this is my uncle. My aunt watched TV in the family room. My uncle ate a sandwich in the kitchen and watched TV there. Did you see how I put my aunt in her place and I did the same thing to my uncle? So, when I have several objects or people in my scene, I must sign them in different places, usually side by side, so they're not physically on top of each other. From then on, I'd sign in those same locations whenever I talk about those objects or people.
Now that you've learned about sign placement, it's an easy jump to understanding the concept of plurals. What are plurals anyway, but more than one? So just do the same thing with two of the same kind of object as you did already with different objects. One ball, two balls, three balls, one tree, two trees, three trees, a forest, one house, two houses, three houses, a city. Two eyes looking, many eyes looking.
Okay, I can spare exactly 12 minutes, so come on. The English language is full of words that describe speed. Rapidly, slowly, briskly, leisurely, lively, sluggishly. Describe intensity. Strongly, half-heartedly, strenuously, lethargically, enthusiastically, apathetically. And describe duration. Briefly, a while, endlessly, continuously. In sign language, you'll communicate the speed, intensity, and duration of action right in your sign. Your facial expression, as always, will help communicate the meaning too, as you can see in the following examples of varying speeds. Rapidly talking, slowly talking. Briskly walking, leisurely walking. Playing a lively game of tennis. Playing tennis sluggishly. And these examples of varying intensities. Strongly encouraging. Half-heartedly encouraging. Strenuously exercising. Lethargically exercising. Enthusiastically welcoming. Apathetically welcoming. And these examples of varying durations. A brief talk. Talk and talk endlessly. Exercise briefly. Exercise and exercise endlessly. There are basically three speeds you need to communicate slow, regular, and fast. And you adjust the speed of your sign accordingly. Regular speed is also the normal, comfortable speed for producing a sign. Like talking, walking, and playing tennis. We crank up the pace for rapid talking, brisk walking, and a lively game of tennis. For slow speed, you just really slow down the pace for slow talking, leisurely walking, and a sluggish game of tennis. You don't have to make any changes to the number of repeated movements in the sign to communicate a slow pace. Now let's talk about intensity. Just like with speed, there are basically three levels of intensity you need to communicate. Low, regular, and high. And you adjust the power of your sign accordingly. Regular intensity is also the normal, comfortable power for producing a sign. Like encouraging exercising, and welcoming. Increase the power of the sign for strongly encouraging, strenuously exercising, and enthusiastically welcoming. You would decrease the power of the sign for half-heartedly encouraging, lethargically exercising, and apathetically welcoming.
And now for duration. There are basically three durations, short, regular, and long. Regular duration is also the normal duration of the sign, like talking and exercising. Decrease the number of repeated movements of the sign to show a short duration, such as brief talk and briefly exercising. Increase the number of repeated movements of the sign to show a long duration, such as a long talk and a long exercise session of maybe an hour or two. Increase the number of repeated movements even more to show endless talking and an exercise session that lasted all afternoon or even all day. You also need to remember that some words we use in English to express intensity and duration are a part of the sign and not separate words like barely and hardly. She can hardly see. He barely talks. So far you've seen how to show intensity in the actions like talking, walking, and exercising. You can also use words like so and very to show intensity in characteristics like beautiful, strong, and heavy. She's so beautiful. He's very strong. And it's very heavy. When you communicate speed, intensity, and duration through your signs, just remember to picture what you're trying to communicate and create that picture through your signs. Now, here's some practice. So what does directionality mean? It just means the direction you sign actions like give, tell, climb, and defeat. Directions? What directions are we talking about? Well, up to now, we've been making all of our signs for actions in a forward direction. But we can sign actions forward and to the left and to the right, up, down, and towards ourselves. So when would we sign give answer, climb, or defeat in any other direction. Well, how about climb? Well, the sign is already in an upward direction. True, but what if you were already up there and wanted to climb down here? Oh, like this. Yes. Can you think of any other signs you learned that go up and down? Well, I guess I can shoot an arrow up and down, or in any direction I wanted to. And I could drive my car uphill or downhill. Right, 
Remember in the last lesson we learned to place people and objects in a scene so that they were not laying on top of each other? After we placed them, we would go back to their locations when we talked about them again. Well, what does this mean? It means that if we're talking about Jim and Jane, we first place them in separate places. Now, if we give something to Jim, we give it in his direction on the right. If we tell something to Jane, we tell it to her in her direction on the left. And if I give something to Jane, I give it to her on the left where she is. If I tell Jim something, I tell him to the right where he is. Right. Now, say Jane wants to give you something. I'd sign give toward me because Jane is giving it to me. And I'd sign it from the left because Jane is on my left. Good. And if Jim wanted to tell you something? I'd sign tell toward me because Jim is telling it to me. And I'd sign it from the right to me because Jim is on my right. Right. Of course, if only Jane is in the scene, you just sign directly forward from you to Jane and from Jane to you. I give something to Jane, she gives me something. I tell something to Jane, she tells me something. I defeat Jane in a game of tennis, she defeats me. And that's basically what you need to know about directionality.
You just learned how to adjust your signing to show duration, but there are a few signs that show the duration of other signs, like again, often, regularly, sometimes, and never. So we're going to teach you these signs here. We also want to teach you the sign for no, even though we'll wait until lesson 19 to show you other signs for thought processes. Why? Because no is a sign you ought to know, and because we commonly sign no in the opposite direction to mean don't know. We also sign want in the opposite direction to sign don't want. When we're finished teaching you these signs, we're going to have a little more fun with the signing features of speed, intensity, and duration. Picture yourself hanging on by your fingertips, but you slipped off. Well, you almost were able to hang on. It is very easy to move the fingertips of one hand with the fingertips of the other. This easy action represents all the things that are easy to do. It's also the sign for simple. Picture the basic part of the international graphic for don't and never. A circle with a diagonal line through it. In one continuous motion, sign never by forming just the right side of the circle and the diagonal line through it. Never. This sign is a combination of the signs for law and against. Move the letter L strongly against your open palm to show that something is prohibited or illegal. Moving your fingertips against the open palm of your other hand represents an action that happens again. Repeatedly moving your fingertips against the open palm of your other hand represents an action that happens again and again, or often. This is also the sign for frequently. Flicking the number one once against your open palm indicates that an action happens once. Flicking it several times indicates the action happens once in a while or sometimes. This is also the sign for occasionally and once in a while. Form fists on both hands with your index fingers extended. Repeatedly strike one fist against the other in a circular motion to indicate that an action happens regularly. Excuse me, I just found this expensive watch in the lobby. You found this expensive watch in the lobby? Yeah, that's what I said. I don't know who to give it to. You don't know who to give it to? That's what I said. Here, find the owner. Find the owner? Must you always repeat everything that I say? Find the owner? Find the owner? Find the owner! We just reminded you that in a spoken language, a simple vocal inflection along with the right facial expression can turn a statement into a question. But how do you accomplish this in sign language? You must rely on your facial expression and in particular, the movement of your eyebrows. I got a perfect score. 
I got a raise? I'm being transferred? Now let's see how to express other types of questions in sign language. You learned in lesson 12 that the sign for true is also the sign for am, is, and are. But remember, in sign language we normally don't sign these words and that applies to questions too. So you'd sign the sentence, Lee is a boy, like this. And the question, is Lee a boy, like this. Did you see how I use my facial expression and especially my raised eyebrows to communicate, hey, I'm asking a question now. Lee is a boy? Raised eyebrows are a part of asking all questions that can be answered with a yes or a no and serve a similar function as voice inflection in spoken languages. You'd also ask questions beginning with do, does, and did in the same way. Do you play tennis? Does he eat crabs? Did you drive to the football game? When you ask a question beginning with can, you're really asking whether or not someone can do something like ski. Can you ski? Or bake cookies? Can you bake cookies? Or help? Can you help me? You sign questions like these just like a sentence. You ski, but add the sign for can at the end along with your raised eyebrows. Finally, one last word we want you to use to ask a simple yes or no question is will. The sign for will is based on the concept of a timeline with the past time behind us the present time directly in front of us, and the future time ahead of us. Will is related to future time, and we sign will like this. Ask a question beginning with will, just like you ask a question beginning with can. Will you go fishing is signed. And use your raised eyebrows. Or will you iron my shirt? Before you leave this lesson, you'll learn many more time-related signs. But now, let's get some practice signing yes or no questions.
you just learn to ask yes or no questions and to raise your eyebrows as you sign them. Now you'll ask questions beginning with who, what, when, where, how, and why, and lower your eyebrows as you sign this type of question. But before you can ask WH form questions, you'll need to learn the signs for who, what, where, when, how, and why. And let's not forget about which and if. The sign for who is based on the shape of your mouth when you say who. Just circle your lips twice as you say who. Think of your fingers as a list of items you're pointing to. What will you do next? The sign for where originated by pointing to different directions. Is it there or there? And the sign became where. Visualize your index finger as the bottom of a grandfather's clock. Now, add the face of the clock on top to make the sign for when. Picture this as the top of a magician's hat and this is the rabbit he pulls from it. How did he do that? The sign for Y includes a modified spelling of the word Y. Touch the fingers of the W to your head where all our questions originate and pull it away to form a Y. Why? The sign for which is based on alternate choices. Which will I choose? The sign for if is based on the scales of justice that tip up and down as the evidence is being weighed. This is also the sign for judge. Use the letter E to sign evaluate. This sign is related to the sign for judge. I'm weighing my options to determine what I might do. This is also the sign for maybe, perhaps, and possibly. Repeatedly spelling D-O-D-O -D -O with both hands is commonly used in sign language to ask, what are you going to do or what do you want me to do? Think of your index finger as an idea that you send from your brain as an answer to a question. Why? For a good cause. For your mother. For a good time. Repeating the sign for twice is commonly used in sign language to mean why or for what reason.
Think of your index finger as the answer to a question that you pull from your brain. Why? Because time's running out. Because it's a good idea. Because I said so. This is also the sign for since, as in, since I'm tired, I think I'll take a nap. In this lesson, we introduced you to the concept of time in sign language as a timeline with the past behind us, the present directly in front of us, and the future ahead of us. You already learned how to ask about the future using the sign for will, which also happens to be the sign for future. In this wrap-up, we'll teach you several more signs based on the concept of a timeline. We'll also teach you signs that are based on the movement of the hands of a clock. The sign for time is based on the face of a clock. Form the letter T and move it clockwise around your palm to indicate the passage of time. Show the movement of the minute hand all the way around the face of the clock for one hour. Show the movement of the minute hand halfway around the face of the clock to indicate half hour. Show the slight movement of the second hand on the face of the clock as it moves ahead one second. Show the small movement of the minute hand on the face of the clock as it moves ahead one minute. This is also the sign for moment. Use the letter L to show forward movement of the minute hand on the face of the clock to indicate the activity will happen at some later time. Think of time as a timeline with the past behind us, the present directly in front of us, and the future ahead of us. The sign for now indicates the time directly in front of us. This is also the sign for present. The sign for in the past indicates the time behind us. This is also the sign for ago and previously. The sign for will indicates the time ahead of us. This is also the sign for in the future. Use this sign for before when referring to the order of events, such as, what did you do before that? The hand represents the present time as the other hand represents the time before the present. Use this sign for after when referring to the order of events such as, what did you do after that? One hand represents the present time as the other hand shows the time after the present. This hand represents something coming to the front because it's the next in a series. The sign for recently indicates the time that is just behind us as we show it using just the index finger instead of the whole hand.
push the present time when someone was supposed to be there into the past to indicate that he is late. This is also the sign for not yet. The hands of time will always be circling the face of the clock. Always. This sign is really three signs. Sign four, then stay, then use the Y hand shape to stay into the future. Think of your index fingers as events that pop up. In life, stuff happens. This is also the sign for occur. Wow! It looks like we've got a lot of time on our hands. Get it? Time on our hands? Hey Daniel, would you bring me that box over there please? I don't know. My back, you know, I gotta be careful. Oh, don't worry. It's very light. Well, okay. If you say so, I'll just go right over here and pick this thing up. Oh, my goodness. You're right. It's very light. My goodness, Daniel. I cannot believe it. That Margaret, she's sunning herself and she's wearing hardly anything at all. Well, I'm just shocked. I'm shocked, too. What in the world have you got that for? Oh, this I'm just following my doctor's orders. She told me that I need an iron supplement. Are you nuts? Oh, I've got those too. We hope you got a kick out of these short skits. Our purpose was just to show you that you've got to always sign what you mean. You learned way back in Lesson 3 that you sign actions based on the objects you're using, like pushing a car or pushing a person, drinking from a cup or drinking from a water fountain and writing on a pad or writing on the side of a box. You also learned how the same word could have different signs for different meanings, like going fishing and eating fish, or being cold, and having a cold, or wearing a watch, and watching something. Now we want you to understand, if you don't already, that every sign you make must communicate the meaning that you have in mind. Which means that you would sign, cut it out, and not cut it out. And if I wanted to butter you up, I'd really sign it this way, as in flattering you. So now you've seen all the key points for this lesson in our little show. So I don't think we'd be telling you a lie because you've got our word. So you'd better do it right or I'm going to have to belt you with a club. Just kidding. <laughs>